2.30 on the dot, so I, I suggest we start. So welcome everyone to session 2B, which is dealing with innovation in traffic management. Um, so my name is Suzanne Hoodley, and I coordinate the thematic area, traffic management, ITS and data at POLIS. And today's session has been um, designed to show how let's say the traffic management task and, and, and the purpose, uh, how it has changed and how it's still evolving. You know, traffic management is no longer just about uh, managing vehicles on our network, on our road network to, um, so that they can flow uh, uh, smoothly. Um, traffic management today is really about, um, I'd say managing and interacting with all different types of road users and traffic management strategy uh, has, you know, is designed to really support the goals of the cities and to solve some of the problems that cities have, like poor air quality. Um, so um, we're going to learn from, you know, the new types of traffic management approaches from our four excellent speakers. Um, so they'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, each and, and then some time for questions. And then for the last 20 minutes, we hope that we will have uh, some time for a, for a panel discussion. Before I introduce you to the, the speakers, uh, I'd just like to give you some practical information about the, 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 this platform and how you can interact with, um, with the speakers and uh, with, with the organizers of the session. Um, so if you want to ask questions, um, you need to uh, go to the chat heading, so to the right of your screen. You click on chat and then on session, and then you can enter your question. If you do not click on session, then you could well be in the event part of chat, in which case your question will be going to the whole uh, event. Um, we will have some polls, as I said, so that's the second heading. You need to click on that and then again on session. And I think when a poll is um, ready, there will be a red dot next to it and um, myself or the speaker will, will inform you that there's a poll uh, awaiting your attention. And then if you want to see who is attending this session and indeed who is uh, in, in the event itself, then you click on people. If the screen is too small, so if the slides on your screen are too small, then you should close the chat box and you can do that by clicking on the arrow above chat. And then finally, um, once the session is over, um, if, you, if you fancy some networking uh, or going to the exhibition area, you can do that by clicking on the icons to, to the left of your screen. Um, so now for our speakers. So we have four speakers, Suzanne Scherz from the city of Stuttgart, Matthias van Weinendal from Belarus, which is the public works agency of Brussels, I believe, Peter Jan Clevens from Utrecht and Deborah Fox from Transport for West Midlands. And I now invite the first uh, speaker, uh, Suzanne Scherz, to, to bring up her slides. So just just stop sharing. So Suzanne Schertz is um, the head of the Road Traffic Authority at the city of Stuttgart. Um, she's had this position since 2015 and her department is responsible for traffic management and regulations, traffic monitoring, vehicle registration, driving permits. And prior to that, um, so from 20, 2006 to 2014, Suzanne was responsible for the unit transport planning and road design at the city of Stuttgart. So she's worked for the city of Stuttgart for uh, many, many years. <laughs> so Suzanne, over to you. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to come up with this um, screen sharing. Um, boom, boom, boom. Can you see the slides? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we try it again. No, I, I, sorry, I'd already left the virtual stage. We could see them. Okay. So, so carry on. Okay. I'll stay on screen for. A, I'll stay on the stage for a while. Okay. Great. Yes, perfect. Oh, perfect. Yes, perfect. There they are. perfect. Wonderful. Are. Okay. So welcome to uh, my presentation um, at this Polis Engineering Conference. As you see, it's sunny in Stuttgart, so um, 
it's sunny but cold, and we will talk about environmentally sensitive traffic management in Stuttgart. Um, the topic about my presentation is about identification of emission critical driving situations and how to harmonize of the traffic flow by the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour. The goal is to have a better air quality and a high efficiency in Stuttgart. So this city Stuttgart is um, the state capital of Baden-Württemberg located in the southern part of Germany. And um, it is a city with about 610,000 inhabitants. Um, what you have to consider is that Stuttgart is the center of a polycentric region with all in all 2.7 million inhabitants, 1 million workplaces and a lot of companies. So there's a lot of transport going on and um, the model split, maybe just to introduce it, we have a very good or excellent public transport. So the public transport share is about 23%. A lot of people are walking, 29% of the model split, 40% is about car transport and 8% about bicycle transport. If you look on the picture on the right side, you see that Stuttgart is quite special. We have an extraordinary topography. So um, this is a big issue which have to be considered even so to air quality. The goal is to strengthen livability and air quality and as I said before, we have an extraordinary topography and we are located in a low wind location. Also, there is a high amount of through traffic and a high share of diesel vehicles. So um, improving the air quality is a big target for the city. And we did come up with a lot of measures in the last years, environmental zones, bans of heavy goods and certain diesel vehicles strengthening of cycling, walking and public transport. We have an enlarged parking space management and we tested up various technical measures as for example filter cubes. What I want to focus and to talk about is the speed limits we have been implemented and the extension of traffic management in combination with the speed limits experiences. So in general, in Germany, on the main road network in urban areas, there's a general speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour. What we did in 2012 was a project at the hotspot Hohenheimer Straße, and we tested out what the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour will have for impacts. Um, we had this um, combination of 40 kilometers per hour and an improved um, parking um, regulations. And if you look up on the picture here below, you see the speed differences before this speed limit. In blue for the right lane of the street and in red for the left lane of the street. And you see with the 40 kilometers per hour, the speed differences have decreased and we have achieved a um, significant harmonization of the traffic flow. As a result of this, we have significant reduction in NOx and nitrogen dioxide. So this um, reduced about seven to nine percent. Outgoing from this experience, um, we came up with a speed with a speed limit on all gradients we have in the Stuttgart Valley Basin. So these um, roads came up to 36 kilometers all in all. In 2018, we started with another project. This was a pilot project with the company of Bosch. And um, we went to the other hotspot at the Neckartro. And as you see, there's no gradient. Um, it's quite flat. We have about 80,000 vehicles per day at this location. And what we saw is that we have a very um, excessive emission during this road which comes up with a intersection and a traffic light and the cars are um, accelerating up to this band, stopping down and then going on. And this driving behavior came to very high acceleration and emissions. Um, this situation was identified by a system and a new approach, which did the company of Bosch by using vehicle data 
and not only the usual FCD, but also the emission data and the uh, driving cycle, which could be identified in a vehicle fleet. So these data can be used to get generate a heat map, which shows you locations where an, with an excessive emission or with excessive um, breakdowns or accelerating um, situations. Also, this system could be used to analyze the results of this tempo uh, speed 40 kilometers per hour, which we have implemented there also. And we saw also at this location that the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour is quite good for the situation and to reduce NOx. To come up with this experiences we did with the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour, um, we have implemented in the year 2020, so this year in the beginning, uh, the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour on all main roads in the entire inner city area and on several main roads in the outer city area. So um, the experiences all confirmed the good results of this measure instead of 50 kilometers per hour in the main road network. As I told you before, we have this beneficial change of driver's behavior. So we came up in the beginning with displays to show the um, driven speed. And we saw that with this displays, we can achieve a harmonization of the traffic flow. In 2019, since then, we are running three mobile um, speed monitoring systems. And with these systems, we also could reduce significantly the vehicles exceeding the speed limit. As I told you before, we have excellent re um, results for the NOx emissions. And all in all, we are um, the opinion that the speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour is a very appropriate speed for an inner urban area because you can smoothen the traffic flow. You have no significant shifting of traffic to other routes. You have no significant loss of capacity. It is appropriate for the public transport because the speed is quite close to the speed which is driven by buses. It is appropriate for bicycle transport and we have a very high acceptance by the public. So let's come back to the approach with Bosch um, company and I show you on the next two slides what we did towards traffic management. In Stuttgart, we are running an integrated traffic management center um, under the charge of uh, the Road Traffic Authority together with the partners, the Road Construction Authority and the Public Transport Operator and the Police Department. Usually we are doing um, emission-based traffic management by forecast. So we see what the environmental data will show us over a year or a period and we have a look on the traffic situation. So we are operating different technical devices as for example, our traffic lights or several um, variable message signs. The goal is to increase the steadiness of the traffic flow and to prevent and reduct the congestion. What we now did is we tendered a project which is called um, traffic flow optimized um, traffic flow optimization due to emission critical driving conditions. So as you see on the left side above, that's the very new approach. What we are doing is we integrate the traffic data coming out from a vehicle fleet. And those data, not only the usual FCD, but also the driving cycle data will be matched together with the other data which is used by traffic management to calculate online a safety calculation and an emission calculation. So what is calculated are the heat maps or the um, trajectories to sudden stops or sudden acceleration. Outgoing from this emission calculation, we have an emission calculation run by the Department for Environment Prediction and these data come up to the operator who sees at the interface 
Um, what is happening outside the heat map with the emissions, emissions or critical driving situations? And the operator can then choose the appropriate operational method, whether that might be a light signal or a traffic information or whatever. Also, we have the chance to report statistics and this gives us another chance to come up with strategic de development. So we have a planning tool where we can analyze and calculate with a microscopic traffic simulation how our results will be of the traffic management. And then we can come up with um, advices, for example, for new needed traffic light programs or for a transport planning project or for um, appropriate traffic regulations. So that project is under tender and we hope to finish it soon. And then we are looking forward to run this new program. Let's have a short outlook what will come next. So the cities are doing a lot of um, yeah, optimization to their traffic management. And even this morning in the session 1B, there was a topic about so the city is having an advice to the, tra to the traffic um, driver and um, saying, for example, you have, to, you have to drive right to come to the city center. And on the other hand, we see that the <clears throat> providers of navigation systems are doing their own route guidance. And the question will be even coming up to quality, air quality or livability. How can we match those two strategies so is there a regulation needed um, that the city interest is to be adapted by the route guidance um, providers? That's from Stuttgart very briefly. And thank you so much. Um, so I, if I could invite um, yes, to go to the poll, uh, to our, so Manon, you're going to put up the poll question. So, so Urban, I can't actually see the poll question myself. Um, Okay, I can't actually see it myself, just one second. Okay. Is it the coordinated network wide traffic management? Shh. No, it's not that one. Okay, right, I've got it, this one. Okay, so the question is, um, do we need regulations so that um, providers of routing services have to adopt municipal traffic management strategies in their routing? So you have the option of four, um, there are four uh, choices, uh, yes, no, in situations to be specified, and I can't actually see the bottom of the poll because I have lots of buttons. But um, if you could uh, uh, answer this poll question. So perhaps um, while we're waiting for the audience to answer, maybe you could explain, Suzanne, why you've asked, asked this question. Um, and what's the position of uh, Stuttgart? You're on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK. Now, as, as mentioned on my last slides, we are doing a lot of efforts to optimize the traffic management um, and we have um, city interests and goals like um, uh, optimized air quality and um, on the other hand, in case of um, incidents, um, we see that the routing um, strategies of the providers are not um, sufficient for our strategies and therefore the question arises whether they're have to be some regulations um, who um, routes the uh, traffic flow in a, in a city. Okay, B 
but in the, I know over the years you've engaged with some information service providers, um, some route planners, I, I believe that's the case. Uh, have you put this question to them and how have they reacted? That's my first uh, sub-question. And then you talk about regulation. I mean, is this something that you would like to see uh, happening at a European level or a national level or what's your view on that? Yeah. Now, indeed, there's a good cooperation with some um, providers. Um, everybody who does traffic management knows that, that some providers don't cooperate so much with cities. Um, what we are doing, we have, we have some projects now at the moment, it's a second project to come up with an interface and a system how we can cooperate strategies with routing providers. Um, so you have to, to have a system and uh, the interface and um, I hope that will be a, a good project coming up with a, with a standard maybe, approach for a standard. And this uh, project is done with a bust, so the, on German national level. Um, we will see whether um, how many providers will um, yeah, cooperate and then the question is for an maybe EU level, yeah. Okay, right, okay. Great, okay, well this is certainly some uh some input we can bring to the European Commission. Commission. So I have one um, other question, and that's about, um, uh, you talked about uh, the, the speed reduction that didn't reduce capacity, the public were happy, it reduced uh, emissions. Uh, so presumably traffic is, is flowing a bit more smoothly than before. Do you think that that could eventually lead to more traffic on your, on your roads? Because I think this is what has you know, it tends to happen as soon as we make traffic flow more smoothly, it can attract more vehicles to the road network. So what's your view on that? Hmm. So, um, yeah, it goes more smoothly, maybe more relaxed for the drivers, um, but the speed is reduced. So, and in fact, we see no changes in the traffic volume, which we can um, come back to this uh, measure. It's quite a stable situation, yeah. But this is quite good, yeah. Okay, we have quite a few questions, so I'll just take one or two. So one is from Matthias, so a fellow speaker. So do you think the same conclusion, so congestion, air pollution could be made um, with uh, 30 kilometers per hour? Um, okay. So in Brussels, uh, the, the maximum speed limit will be 30 kilometers in Brussels throughout the Brussels region in 2022, apparently. So what's your view on going down even further from 40 to 30? So that's an, an interesting discussion because um, I, I know in, in Berlin we have also many roads with 30 kilometers per hour. So in the beginning of this um, air quality discussion, there have been test drivings and we saw that especially at a gradient, um, on a gradient you have a better emission reduction with 40 kilometers, um, even to diesel vehicles. Um, so it's better than 30 kilometers per hour. The other thing is that at intersection you have a, a better um, throughput concerning um, um, follow-up times or clearing times. So maybe the capacity at intersection, at big intersections, might be better with 40 kilometers per hour. Um, on the other side, for bicyclists, um, 30 kilometers per hour might be better than 40. That's um, no doubt here. Yeah. But um, we are quite happy with this 40 kilometer per hour. It's a little bit so reduced, but not too much reduced, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll take one more question and then there are other questions for you. So Susanna, I will ask you maybe to respond to some of those questions okay, in, in writing. Uh, so we have a question here about, um, Okay, does the optimization also look at potential detours with longer journey times for users and therefore more emissions? Yeah, yeah, that's the same question. We have we had this um, analysis at the hotspot um, Hohenheimstraße in Hecator, and there are no uh, re reroutings, um, so the traffic flow is on this road and stays there, which is quite great. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Um, um, I think we will now move on to our second uh, speaker, um, which is um, Matthias van Weinendel, who is the um, 
cycling policy advisor, oh no, who is today the uh, uh, mobility expert and cyclist at Belirist, which is a public works agency of the Brussels region. And he is responsible for traffic management during the Brussels Metro Works, which he's going to talk about in his presentation. So over to you, Matthias. We can't hear you, you're muted. We can see your slides. It's good that you can, can see the slides already. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, so um, well, welcome to this session. Uh, I'm here in the first place to listen to the to the other uh, cities, of course, uh, but I will talk also a little bit about the the new metro line we are building and constructing uh, in the north of uh, Brussels and how we uh, organize the mobility, how we do the mobility management uh, for the the road closures that are needed. Um, and so we talk a lot about road diversions and the impact and the modal shift during these uh, major works. The metro line in Brussels is a five, kilometer, a five kilometer tunnel, new tunnel with seven new metro stations. And maybe more important is that it also has seven new public spaces um, uh, after the construction of the, the metro stations. And if we talk about uh, metro extension works, we, we, we talk a lot about technicity and the techniques, engineering and the budget and the planning. But uh, a big ma ma major uh, infrastructure project um, has a lot uh, to do uh, underneath also with uh, a big a large program for citizens and neighborhoods uh, and it's with a lot of people that are involved. Eh? Uh, it's about communication, participation, but it's also about all, uh, all the accompanying measures such as uh, legal uh, measures and noise disturbance and compensations for grocery stores, etc, uh, etc. Et and in general, we, we, we name it, it's, it's the involvement of uh, people, uh, the stakeholdership, and uh, it's the notion that our works are not being done alone uh, in, in, a, in an empty area. Uh, there are a lot of people concerned. Underneath the involvement is the bigger cause and, and the reason why uh, Brussels wants to create a metro line. And uh, the, the reason why Brussels is doing this, this is to shift people from the car to the public trans transport and to uh, build livable spaces, eh? livable places around these metro stations. Um, the traffic management, the planning of all these uh, works is done in, done in a central, uh, via a central system, central procedure and a central software. Uh, and it's the interaction between all the works. Eh? At this moment, I took a print screen from it. Uh, it is about uh, 600 uh, construction sites, uh, small and big for the next year. And uh, there are small, smaller uh, private works, but also public works involved and also all the pre preparation works uh, needed for the, the metro uh, construction. Uh, for example, the renovation of tram, tram rails uh, to maintain the public uh, transport accessibility and the displacement of all the piping, uh, such as gas, electricity and water. So in detail, what we do is, um, we, we monitor the works, is, as you see here, the, the layer B, the, the external works with our internal works, the metro works, and we uh, put in place road diversions um, and uh, strategic access that we want to um, keep uh, and to guarantee and keep uh, accessible at all time. And so what we do is, is we check and we monitor if uh, some, uh, if a public works, uh, public works are in conflict with the metro works or with these uh, strategic access. And this is what traffic management is for us. Uh, I think there are two phases. You have first time, on the first hand, you have the real-time side uh, traffic management system, as uh, Suzanne, I think, uh, was uh, showing uh, as well um, for, for Stuttgart. What we are doing, and for example, here you can see traffic service uh, tool uh, in Netherlands. But what we are doing is um, using uh, historic data to make some predictions, to develop scenarios and to learn from the past. Um, and so we are not so much interested in real-time uh, mobility data. I will give you a little bit uh, um, 
a look behind behind the scenes uh, from what we call hypercoordination is the traffic management around these uh, major construction works works and of course in Bu in brussels if you come to brussels uh, public works uh, you see a lot of um, panels blue and yellow and uh, you see a lot of the road diversions uh, what we saw in the past is that hyper coordination and so the coordination of these works were a lot car oriented and still it's uh, still a major concern second um, we did all the study uh, studying work was done with manual counting and with simulation studies and so it's good it's very good it's very um, reliable it's very it's done by experts but the problem is that these studies they took a lot of time approximately three months uh, to to organize the, the counting campaigns and to make all the simulations and then to make uh, reports validated by by the people and political level and so um it's it takes uh, more than three months the last element is that the decision the decisions decisions were made by a closed group of experts such as the administrators uh, engineers the contractors the police department and so we want to um, make this um, more open and the question is how can we involve more people about uh, not so sexy thing as uh, public works so i will show you three changes in traffic management and uh, how we try to cope with it and the first uh, change is um, that good move is a new uh, sump that was approved this year uh, for the next 10 years and it is a sump uh, who is very that is very ambitious eh? this is uh, the the major road network today and this is how it will look in 2030 and you see that a lot of roads are um are made local and not um, not um, um, yeah uh, real connectors or main roads anymore main roads anymore and I think this is a major uh, change and shift uh, for us. A second change is that people want to get involved. Eh? If we do public works, we we thought we we want to do good communications about disturbances. Uh, we have even a WhatsApp. Um, uh, net, uh, net, network uh, to inform the people um, when there are works coming up um, but getting involved can be more than uh, communication uh, and I want to give you a good example it's about telram.net uh, wecount.net in English and it's a it's a program where people themselves can make their low res camera put it in front of the window and then um, uh, count the number of uh, cars and bikes that are traveling and this is a way to if here you can see the number of, of road um, parts that are counted uh, in Scharbeek so uh, next to the metro uh, works and so this is a, moment, a way to to involve uh, people uh, the third change, and that is the, the mobility data revolution, where we, we talk a lot about uh, mobility as a service and other um, ITS related uh, topics. But for me, I think that the ecosystem, mobility ecosystem, is changing from three layers to five layers. Eh? So we have infrastructure, transport services, and then users using these services. This is what we know today. But in the future, I think there will be uh, a layer on uh, a data layer that gets involved and also a front end, uh, front end services that will, um, will be um, visible more and more. And so what does it mean for traffic management for us? Uh, what we think is that we, we want to um, uh, put in place a data hub that collects, collects different sources of data, not only the counting campaigns as we did it in the past, but also floating car data and multimodal data uh, and camera data and to, to, into a, a central data hub. And therefore we launched uh, now a, a major um, uh, contract uh, with an external um, it's an external mission and so the most important thing is to know what is the output data uh, from it and so um, 
on the on the output data uh, we really need these historic data analytics tools uh, for our studies and our planning um, on the input side we have floating car data this is the most visible uh, mobility data of course you know google maps with the red orange and green colors uh, but uh, it's very hard to obtain relevant data from google and therefore uh, and this, the biggest problem is that the data uh, is only car related and therefore we are looking for uh, other projects such as bike citizens you can see uh, above uh, this is a spider grid uh, of uh, origin destination of cyclists and uh, on the beneath uh, you can see um, a heat map of um, bike traffic concentration in the area of the metro works and so then we can know where are the the bikes or what happens if we close a road uh, what is the origin destination of uh, bikes that are affected uh, from a road closure and it's so important to not have only uh, car data but also uh, other modes of course there are still counting campaigns and um, in the past we had manual counting and these, these uh, classic tubes but in the future we will have more and more um, um, uh, continuous uh, AMPR uh, technology and also continuous counting uh, for example with this uh, Siemens uh, uh, TU5 uh, module or with the, the bike counters. And again, Telram is also a good example, as I explained, because it's multimodal. Eh? So it, it makes, it gives uh, insights in uh, mobility data, but not only for cars, also, also for pedestrians and cyclists. And so this is how um, the, 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 the infrastructure will look like. Uh, you have on the one side input data, then we have the processing and the, the storage. And then on the other side, we, we will not uh, take a lot of time to, to discuss the, the real time uh, data, but we will mainly focus on historic data because this gives us great insights in travel behavior during road closures. And so uh, on the output side, um, the, the first example is uh, average weekly traffic count. Uh, we were able to count uh, the number of cars and the number of bikes uh, in 74 streets uh, in Brussels. And therefore we were able to show um, how traffic uh, developed during the lockdown. And um, as we were able to show a drop in car traffic, we were able as well to concentrate high impact works uh, during um, during the lockdown and so more works with higher impact in less time were concentrated during uh, this period and the second example is um, travel times example is um, is uh, is, a, is a good example because we sh we closed a uh, road and in the road next to it uh, we saw in the first days uh, an increase in the travel time and so in congestion on the street um, because of this road closure and during the road closure uh, we saw that a lot of traffic was diverted to another street and so uh, suffered from congestion but after several weeks and that's what you can see in the blue line um, the impact was already reduced um, so let me make a little bit uh, a little conclusion uh, if you want to build um, a mobility data project I think it's first very important to write uh, good use cases and to determine which kind of out, uh, output you want uh, which is the relevant data and uh, forget about heat maps in the first place uh, I think uh, some some good graphics uh, can can help as well uh, and second we need to ensure that uh, all mode data mobility data is available and that you not only use uh, car traffic data finally we should look after proper analytics tools that are on the market uh, and that are available so um, if we avoid uh, car focus i think public works uh, can be a catalyst for change, for mobility change, uh, for a sustainable model shift. Uh, road closures can learn us a lot about mobility behavior from people during these uh, road closures, not only in the first days, but also uh, after several weeks. Eh? Uh, this is a, an important time uh, lapse. We need to think uh, how our infrastructure works can create a mental shift uh, for um, uh, 
a good move, as we say in Brussels, um, for a, a more sustainable urban mobility. Because finally, the end goal for us is to have more quality of life. Um, and uh, I think public works can help uh, in achieving this goal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Um, very nice presentation. I think we actually have a poll. So I'll ask my uh, colleague Manon to show the question. So for mobility management of construction works, historic mobility data is more important than real time mobility data. So do you agree or disagree? Uh, so if you could please um, uh, uh, enter the poll and perhaps Matthias, you can uh, uh, reflect a bit on, you know, why you asked this question. Yeah, because uh, first of all, we, we were, what we did was we did it in the wrong way. I think the, our analysis after, afterwards uh, said, uh, so we were first looking after all the kind of um, uh, tools that existed already. And then you see that a lot of attention goes to near time or real time uh, mobility data. But finally, for us, it was not so uh, interesting. Eh? And uh, I think now, last year, we see more and more uh, historic uh, analytics tools as well. Um, and therefore, it's a question I, I will, I want to ask to other experts and other uh, cities. Um, how they see the importance of, of historic uh, data. For us, it's the, the, the main, um, the main uh, data set or the main data flow uh, that, that is important to us. Okay. Well, if you look at the uh, poll, I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Uh, so um, two thirds, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's a split two thirds, one third. So one third think. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, yeah, they agree. It, yeah. yeah. It, and th therefore, uh, yeah. maybe it's an interesting question because yeah. it, it shows that that the first the first idea is that that real time, of course, data is the most important one. Uh, but um, but it's it's very uh, it's a lot about reactivity, and so you re react when uh, a congestion is mm -hmm. done or when. Um, uh, crossing is blocked or something, um, but we should also uh, do a lot uh, rex, uh, retour d'experience yeah. and we need to also evaluate after we closed a road and that is so important. We forget about it sometimes. Yeah, real time is really operational. It's really at yeah. the, that specific mo moment. In but of course, time. it was a little bit to, to have this discussion. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'm just looking at the, uh, the, the chat, but there are some questions for you before I um, go to the audience question. I just have one question. I mean, this is still um, is, is a concept. You said it hasn't been implemented yet. And uh, so my question to you is, will you work for Belarus, which is a public uh, works agency? Uh, the traffic management uh, center is part of the mobility agency, I guess, uh, Brussels Mobility. So to what extent yeah. have you been working across agencies? We, we work together, of course, and the um, Verkeer uh, Centrum in, in Brussels, Mobiris, uh, yeah, these, these are our, our colleagues and we work a lot uh, together, but of course they focus a, um, a lot on, on real-time uh, um, uh, flows, but the most important thing is that they, they have now data points uh, installed on uh, mainly on the crossings and we want to integrate the data they collect into uh, this data hub I was uh, talking about. Um, because today a lot of counting campaigns are done and then this report or this data is put apart in, in some, uh, in some uh, case and uh, never uh, watched again. And so the, the, the biggest um, uh, challenge is to to use all the data and counting campaigns that are available for our future analysis. And so, um, yeah, it's it's um, an innovation. It, it means that we do it this way for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we learn, st we're still learning a lot. Okay. How to do this, yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, we have uh, one or two questions from the audience. So first I'll go to a member of the audience. Um, so do you use information from mobile phones to examine traffic flows per mode before and after works? Yeah, so we do it. It's integrated in the, the mobility um, 
uh, how do you say it in, in English, like the, the, the mobility market that we launched, uh, the tender we did. And so it's integrated that we can use this uh, floating car data or floating mobility data. And that's what the, the rep responses of the, of the available tools is that we have ODQ, uh, Google Maps and, and uh, TomTom and all this stuff is a lot about car data. And I think we, we need to be sure that we have also relevant uh, data from uh, bikes, for example. And so it, that, that is, it's less available at this time. Okay, so the, the tender you mentioned, so do you have one contract with like a data um, integrator or aggregator or do you have individual contracts with the different data sources? No, we have one big contract uh, mm -hmm. that needs to um, give us uh, the tool and it needs to make uh, the tool available uh, for us uh, and it has uh, origin destination analysis, okay. uh, simulations and, uh, and other kind of analysis uh, uh, to do and so it's integrated and so but of course what we saw is that the the, the offers that 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 came up that was like a conglomerate of uh, different um uh, different uh, experts that uh, work together to to respond to this uh, this one study yeah okay great thank you right I have one final question then um from uh, a co-speaker so um from deborah so they have a metro in the West Midlands. Um, so do you have a single view of other disturbances in Brussels at the same time as, as metro? I don't know if that question is clear enough. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, we have a single view of all the disturbances in Brussels. It, this is this central platform, it's called Osiris. And so everything, if, even when you want to, uh, to, to, build a scaffolding uh, at your house you need to introduce it and to input it into this uh, central system to obtain uh, um, an author uh, authorization to do it and so we have a complete view of all the disturbances and works that are planned in advance the question is the, we have it and then the the question is what what can we do with it and so the, this is the, the the real challenge is to make mobility uh, scenarios and plannings in advance and to change uh, uh, timings or disturbances and to to prevent uh, yeah, road closures that are completely um, blocking uh, all traffic or all accessibility for example okay Okay, well, we're going to have to uh, close there. If there are any more questions, there may well be, then I invite you, Matthias, to respond to them in, in the chat box. The session, yeah. um, and we can move to our third speaker, speaker so Peter Jan Klevens from the city of Utrecht, who is senior advisor. Uh, so he uh, he's a real traffic management expert, having started uh, his uh, career as a traffic light controller in Amsterdam in, in 1980. And um, so he's been working at the city of Utrecht now in various positions for, for 30 years. And he's retiring, so this is going to be his last uh, 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 conference, uh, at least as a, a member of the Utrecht staff. But if you want to join in the future as a, as a citizen, then I'm sure uh, we can find a way for you to join, Peter. So over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. That will be very nice. Uh, you can hear me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Send me uh, an invitation for next year and uh, we'll see if <laughs> okay. I would like okay, to have it live. Then I'm trying to, sh to share my, I'm going to share my, my uh, presentation now. Just okay. a sec. I'll okay. tell you when it comes up because I know it's not obvious. Okay. Uh, here we go. This one. Okay, now share. Sharing now. Do you see it? I think it's coming up perfect. All right. Okay. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation. Um, well, English is not my native tongue, so please forgive me for my lingual mistakes and uh, we'll see what happens. And my presentation is, is about the Utrecht traffic management approach and what we are planning to do for the next two years in the field of traffic management. 
In the past four years, uh, Utrecht has, uh, together with her regional partners, have invented and developed the traffic management tools specialized for uh, dedicated use uh, for traffic for network management scenarios uh, in a multimodal way. So not only for uh, for cars, but also for cycle uh, bicycles and uh, uh, public transport, and uh, of course, in some ways, uh, even for pedestrians. Uh, as you can see um, on the slide, uh, a number of very useful and interesting tools there are. I've talked about these in the past uh, two, uh, two years, also on, on the POLIS uh, conference. All right, uh, as, as you can see, uh, Radar Q Estimator, a, a, uh, a very special, uh, sophisticated cyclist detection, where we can uh, uh, detect clusters of cyclists uh, and also their speed and all kinds of hardware and software. We have tested both the invented tools, the hardware and the software, and also a new concept of network uh, management. Uh, all these innovations were brought together in the proof of concept uh, Utrecht West, and I've talked about this already the previous three years also on this Polis annual. So I'm, I'm, uh, I hope maybe one or two of you have also uh, learned from those also. The automatic traffic management uh, of the regional network uh, with the regional network man management system. Okay, um, what uh, is the result is that there is more automation in, in network management and less and less human interference. So um, uh, the, the system regulates itself. Um, and of course, we have uh, done the past few, uh, few years, we've also shared our knowledge and educated our colleagues, but also we shared the knowledge on uh, on uh, uh, national uh, on a national scale and even on a European scale, as for at the moment. Um, what we will do this year and next year, what we did th this year and next year, is that uh, we will um, uh, provide the city with a multi-modal network approach. Traffic management until now is almost always developed as part of urban projects. So the cash flow, the project planning and the project boundaries prevail over the traffic management requirements. To improve this situation, we need a citywide multimodal network approach. We also needed to customize the invented tools of the past two years, two or three years, and the software for the, uh, to make a different expenses and qualities for different solutions. We always went for the highest possible quality, which also brings high expenses. So we had to uh, see if we, if we could make more differences in those expenses. And of course, what we have to do this, what we started this year and what we have to do next year is to sort out the ownership organization and the maintenance, uh, because this is done together with our regional partners and stakeholders um, we uh, we also need to know who who will be the owner of of, of the of the assets and the software. Therefore, we have uh, new kinds of contracts and new kinds of agreements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, needed. All right, uh, just a quick glance at our main network. As you can see, uh, we are uh, obviously our relationship with our regional partners is very heavy, uh, where th their problems will also be our problems and vice versa. Right, um, you see here an overview of what we are doing. And uh, uh, as I said, we needed a citywide approach for traffic management. Until now, the management was uh, also, I also said that, uh, developed uh, within urban development projects. And um, this is far too narrow. Traffic, traffic management measures often extend beyond the project boundaries. And also they, uh, they need to be uh, maintained after the project has finished. And um, what, I, what we also uh, uh, saw was that uh, the one urban project causes mobility challenges into an, an adjacent urban project. So there were, um, you know, uh, there, was, there was a lot of competition between projects um, uh, traffic management wise. So the, uh, this was, um, uh, we said this, uh, this uh, it's time now to make an, a city-wide approach for traffic management. What we had to do, um, do was make a framework 
uh, traffic management framework. We did this in five uh, steps. In the past uh, three months, we have been working on these uh, on this uh, tactical framework, and we started with uh, the policy principles, gathering all the visions and policy input for the next uh, steps. Then the accessibility profiles to see um, what what accessibility you you need to have for certain areas. There are high profile areas, business areas which need a, which need a high accessibility on a multimodal scale. But there are also areas which are not uh, very uh, for which accessibility is not so very high uh, necessary. And uh, and then you need to have the functional organization. Which challenges will you? Uh, start to, to take on first and which can be passed for the next year. We also had, oh wait, my slide won't go. Oh, next one. Yeah. Then when you have sorted out your challenges, you make the multimodal priorities. And this is really something different than uh, the past uh, uh, 30 years uh, at the traffic light uh, uh, in, uh, intersections, for instance. Um, you tried to um, to keep everybody happy. Uh, at this moment, we are uh, we recognize that that is not possible. If you choose for the bicycle, which we do in Utrecht, it is really we really choose for bicycle and pedestrians. You really have to make it uh, difficult for the other mod uh, modalities of uh, uh, modes, like for instance the the car. And at this moment, with COVID, um, we also see that public transport is also uh, uh, is well quite um, quite an issue. People do not want to uh, go with public transport, so they choose the bicycle. And so we have to really have to uh, uh, keep this in focus. And even uh, later on, when COVID uh, is passed, hopefully we will still maintain this uh, this bicycle focus. All right, and after that. Um, we need to uh, to put all those uh, choices into real values and criteria so that we can measure them. Okay, so what we did this after uh, these three months is to come together in, in all kinds of sessions, but because of COVID, of course, we did this on uh, uh, on a video scale, on a digital scale, and we used uh, just uh, for your information, we used the mural. Uh, um, software it it is uh, very i found it uh, very nice to work with it is uh, like you uh, are, are gathered around a big table or uh, around a couple of whiteboards you can you can uh, uh, simultaneously uh, a, a sticker all kinds of stuff put sticky notes and and make comments and and so on and so on it is a very nice way to to really make work uh, working sessions together with a lot of colleagues and um uh, so I recommend it also. I have here two, uh, two of those mural sessions. Uh, one is here for the bicycle network and another one here for the pedestrian uh, network. And um, we did this with uh, um, also for the, um, uh, with all our colleagues and uh, uh, traffic engineers, policy advisors, regional partners, stakeholders, uh, uh, as I said, public transport, cyclists, and so on, and so on. Uh, sometimes we were with about uh, 30 people, 30 and uh, 30 to 35 people gathered around these mural sessions. So this is what we did. Um, of course, I just now talked about that also the invented uh, 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 assets we, uh, we invented and we developed uh, the past couple of years were all the, um, the state of the art assets, the best quality you can get. And um, they are not needed for every uh, traffic management situation. And um, so uh, there are some uh, situations where you need less, uh, less quality. Uh, we, for instance, we had many radar units. We had dedicated data streams. We had connections only on fiber optics. And um, so we ask ourselves, can we do this in a less costly way? So there is a better chance of a large scale rollout in the region or even in the country. And uh, maybe the highest possible quality of the tools is not needed in every regional area for uh, uh, still for proper network management. So um, 
we had did a worldwide research on all kinds of methods for this uh, detection and data fusion. And to, uh, to have, give you a little of an idea, um, this is one of the um, one of the extensive assessment uh, 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 schematics we did for these possibilities. You do not have to try to read it; it is in Dutch anyway. So, but just to show you that we did that we did a lengthy uh, uh, exploration on all the different aspects. So, uh, what we found uh, in some cases that it is possible to decrease the total in investment costs as well as the cost for maintenance. For instance, less assets making the use of ex existing assets, assets and uh, some serious adjustments also in the algorithms and the software were needed because if we use less assets, then you need also to uh, adjust your algorithms. Um, we had an ac acceptable quality reduction, uh, less, uh, for instance, less uh, predictable buffer fillings and uh, a little less refined and elegant uh, traffic management system. But by the use of existing uh, uh, tra traffic light uh, loops and the wireless uh, pods instead of um, of the, um, the 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 glass, uh, how do you call it, the um, the fiber optics, and uh, you know, doing more with uh, the with the uh, wireless uh, wireless uh, kind of uh, um, uh, communication. Uh, wireless connections. Uh, this all worked for reducing the cost. And what uh, what is also a very big cost reducer is if you allow a longer downtime of your or of parts of the system in case of malfunction. We really wanted uh, to uh, to uh, have an immediate response when uh, when the um, system uh, uh, when parts of the system were down or when a radar was down or something like that and this really uh, gives uh, big expenses so um, in the in the end we managed uh, to get a really 50 percent cost reduction as well as in the investment as also in the maintenance okay so this is what we uh, what we did in the last uh, in this last year, uh, actually the last uh, six or seven months uh, during COVID time. So what we will do next year is um, we will uh, make a roadmap. We will uh, uh, develop a roadmap to do this uh, independent municipal service uh, for coordinated network traffic management. Uh, we completed our uh, multimodal network approach this year and uh, with the technical framework, which I just talk, uh, told you about. And uh, we also uh, uh, managed to make a less costly uh, way of traffic management. Um, so this, uh, with this roadmap, which we will focus on next year, well, I'm saying we all the time, but my colleagues, of course, because I won't be doing this anymore, uh, this uh, roadmap, uh, for this independent uh, municipal uh, municipal traffic management service, um, we this, we really need this because we have to take it out of the the urban uh, development projects and we have to put this as a service from the municipality towards the projects. Um, of course, we will also be sorting out uh, the ownership and the organization and the maintenance with our regional partners and stakeholders. So, well, uh, I don't know how many time there's left but um, I have come to an end of my presentation and um, actual, actually I have put my poll here but I have uh, discovered that it's already also in the poll section so I will uh, cross it and thank you very much for your, um, for your uh, attendance and uh, maybe you have questions I leave it up now to you I will stop sharing let's see how i do this okay that's um, fine so yeah there is a, a poll question there so the question is coordinated network traffic management should be either urban project related and should be dealt with within the urban development projects or the second option is uh, that coordinated traffic management should be a city-wide municipal service 
to which a yeah. development project should uh, submit to. So if you would uh, please uh, make your choice now and Petian, perhaps you can uh, uh, explain uh, 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 your motivations for this uh, yeah. particular well, question. Uh, the motivation wa was, uh, I already told it in the, in the, in the presentation, because we discovered that um, uh, during the urban projects, um, the traffic management was always a bit on the, let's say, on the on the on the backside of the of the project, and uh, on the last uh, in 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 when the projects uh, were um, well f uh, reaching to the end, then the people were thinking about, oh well, there's traffic management to do, and uh, budgets were always short, and you you couldn't get to the to the real standards of the traffic management, and also because the uh, one project. Uh, um, will um, will not consider anything a traffic management with another project so the they will they were uh, they were throwing traffic to each other's project uh, to keep their own uh, to keep their own roads uh, a, a bit uh, um, uh, sustainable so um yeah uh, it is uh, it is because of those things that uh, we thought well we need a really municipal municipal service towards projects in which we as a municipality um, uh, will give the the regulations and the, the 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 playing field of the traffic management okay and when by projects you mean it could be local projects national funded projects uh, uh mostly the urban development projects like uh, a, a new a new office uh, uh neighborhoods new uh, you know the uh, Utrecht is very, very uh, in a, is all already fifteen years is completely in development all the time, and um, uh, in the coming four years, I think, uh, for no, yeah, and until twenty twenty five, there will be uh, a, a lot of new housing projects, and mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So, yeah, it is growing, and we cannot expand our own. Uh, uh, traffic uh, network anymore. We do not want to expand it. Uh, actually, we are downgrading a lot of the the, the more main high roads in in the city, and uh, so yeah, uh, we need to to to, uh, to to compensate this with with uh, with with good traffic management. But of course, above that, we also need to do mobility management because the traffic management is what what is managing the traffic which is mm -hmm. left after you do a. Uh, uh, well, uh, do a well uh, mobility management uh, uh, yeah, pro okay. program. Okay, well, we have the results of the polls. So 72%, uh, so the majority think it should be um, a citywide municipal service. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, so you've got your, uh, <laughs> your, your, your validation there. So we just have time maybe for, there are a few questions for you. We'll take just maybe one question and, and then I'll invite you to uh, respond to the other questions. So, um, so one question is, so the 50% cost reduction is really impressive. Well done. I think you're going to uh, receive lots of uh, 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 messages uh, uh, during this conference about this. So did you experience any security issues due to replacing fiber optics to wireless communication? That is a very good question. We did not yet, but um, we will. Uh, that is because um, uh, we we did not uh, imp implement it and rolled it out in a, on a very light large scale, um, and uh, f for this um, I think that um, in in the in the coming years uh, this it will be uh, a, a, an issue to uh, really make sure that privacy and security is still uh, um, is, is still uh, very very well uh, maintained uh, uh, because um, the the way uh now we uh, we did the the um the wireless and the the uh, uh the wireless communication is uh, uh quite um what shall i say um it is factory dependent and uh, not yet uh, so it's 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 a closed a very closed way of uh, of communication and the downside, the upside is that there is not a very, there is not really a security or a privacy issue. But the downside is, is that the data is not widely uh, available. 
And um, so that is one of the issues we are we are discussing now. Uh, because of, uh, obviously we as traffic managers would like to have all the data in one big database and we so that we can make data fusion and 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 so on and so on and if we want to do that then uh, it is possible that uh, not not security but privacy issues will be uh, uh, coming yeah okay Okay, well, thank you. We're going to have to uh, bring this uh, your, your your slot to a close. So thank you very much, uh, Peter. But we should have we might have the opportunity to have a quick chat uh, after our final speaker, who is um, Deborah Fox from um, Transport for West Midlands, and um, Deborah is head of demand uh, demand management at Transport for West Midlands since uh, 2018 and demand management is one of the three key pillars of congestion management in the West Midlands and I think Deborah is going to be continuing on the theme of sweating the assets and, and trying to keep costs down for, for traffic management so very timely. Over to you Deborah. Thank you so much Suzanne and uh, Manon is hopefully going to show my slides. We've had a few technology issues uh, this afternoon. So um, just to set a little bit of context around the West Midlands in the United Kingdom, uh, Manon's hopefully going to go straight on to uh, my next slide. And uh, so uh, in the West Midlands, we're feeling the positive benefits of devolution from Westminster. And uh, we're through our economic strategy, we want to be the best uh, place in the United Kingdom to do business. With that brings its own challenges. So for example, around 200,000 new houses are being built in the West Midlands. And on the next slide, you can see some of the strategic context. Manon, thank you. Uh, the strategic context for, uh, for that uh, from our uh, economic uh, strategy through to our regional transport plan, uh, which is currently uh, being refreshed to pick up all the latest uh, challenges uh, around the pandemic and beyond. So on my next slide, uh, I have an infographic to show to you. Uh, it may be quite difficult to, to read this. So uh, just to give you some context, we have around 3 million people in the West Midlands. And of that, around half of them live in Birmingham. Uh, there will be around 444 uh, the uh, new people coming, 44, uh, 444,000, excuse me, new people coming to the region uh, by 2035. And if you look at, the, at that on a daily basis, it's 100 extra people coming to the region every day until then. Uh, so that would fill half a tram, 84 cars or one and a half buses, for example. So on my next slide, it gives you a sense of how in the West Midlands we're trying to address that uh, in transport terms. So as well as a huge investment programme going on, a uh, capital investment programme into transport infrastructure, into new rail stations, into uh, metro tram uh, and into the high speed rail to uh, rail system as well. Uh, behind the scenes, we have a new regional transport coordination centre. Uh, that I might relate, relate to later as RTCC. And within this, we have uh, hardware. So we have a CCTV control center that you can see here. And also we have uh, a lot of data and insight behind the scenes, helping us to be, build a single view of all of the disruptions or disturbances on the network uh, and working towards a real-time view of the network to help us to uh, really help manage uh, significant amounts of congestion and also minor disruptions around roadworks. Uh, but these are not uh, roadworks that are just for uh, a brief period of utilities. They are large regeneration programmes, sometimes for two years or more at a time. So on my next slide, This uh, gives you a sense of the customer revolution that we're aiming to achieve. And my work is very much about uh, weaving between all the modal experts to achieve a revolution for our customer. Uh, a multimodal journey planner, uh, push notifications, uh, really aiming to nudge uh, behaviour change and achieve that in our large trip generators like large businesses and education sites. 
uh, to uh, do that through ticketing. We have a SWIFT uh, ticketing product uh, similar to the London Oyster Card. Uh, we also invest a lot in our communications and in digital channels. And uh, we also have a contact center. And for certain events on the network, and uh, the most recent being the return to school of uh, 100,000 school pupils at the beginning of September, uh, we do get a huge amount of uh, people calling our contact center, uh, wanting uh, direct help and support. And so uh, what we are increasingly looking uh, to do is to enhance our face-to-face -face contact with uh, some more automated systems. So on my next slide. You can see here our communications and engagement strategy and as well as uh, direct travel demand management engagement with businesses and education sites. Uh, we're also looking uh, to use uh, our whole range of communications techniques uh, and building a virtuous circle uh, between reliability, so the single source of the truth, the trusted source, uh, to build trust and then uh, a, in a cyclical way achieve uh, more and more behaviour change. And on my next slide, I hope uh, you will see our uh, disruption yellow branding. And this has proven really, really popular uh, in the West Midlands and outside of it, uh, whether it be used on our Twitter feed at WM Roads uh, or campaign pages on our network West Midlands website uh, or else uh, beam to people on their uh, Facebook pages where we request uh, admin rights for local Facebook pages to tell people what is happening in their area. And I'm a very strong believer uh, that, yes, we need to understand the transport and we sure need to understand the, tra the technology. However, we need to understand people just as much in order to uh, predict uh, and also to help them make better travel choices uh, in and around our region. So uh, on the next slide. I want to tell you a little bit about a, a project that I'm involved with, uh, which is one of uh, National Adept Smart Places Live Labs programme. And in that, our Network Resilience Live Lab is uh, really aiming to uh, approach congestion in a very proactive and um, data-led way. Uh, we have four work streams, uh, our fixed asset operations, which is looking to mobilize uh, cameras across the network in the most cost-effective way uh, with partners like uh, West Midlands Police. Uh, data and analytics, which is looking at all the data feeds coming in, especially through the analytics and also other sources uh, like Waze and Google, for example. Then uh, working with uh, people to identify their personas and increasingly be able to target our communications bespoke to their needs. And one of the things we've done recently is introduce a text message system. And we want to get more and more sophisticated about targeted and bespoke messaging to people. And finally, my own work stream, which is knowledge sharing. Uh, and as well as the project sponsor for the, for the project, I'm also involved in knowledge sharing. And, and that's why I'm here today. So uh, I may not have the chance to show all of the slides in my presentation. Uh, but what I want to do is just give you uh, a sense of uh, some of the activities going on in that project. And so on my next slide, uh, you can see here that we are uh, taking uh, now uh, a million and a half data feeds in off the cameras deployed on the network. And uh, the way we've approached data ethics on that is to work with our partners, West Midlands Police, uh, who have very, very advanced uh, consultation processes for mobilizing new cameras. And also uh, we can obtain data from them uh, that is uh, hashed. And so we're not uh, tracking individuals on the network. Uh, we're taking volumes of data uh, that will show us origins and destination, um, but is not trackable, which is the right thing to do. And on my next slide, uh, you can see how some of that is coming across in dashboards. And uh, we're starting to observe um, some patterns in traffic and testing that uh, between now and the end of November. And uh, Matthias raised the interesting point about historic data sets. So we don't own historic data sets. And that is a, a, 
uh, has been uh, an issue in building up our picture of this project. However, as we go forward and build up historic data sets, it gives us a basis from which we can um, predict and use video analytics. So on my next slide, please, Manon. You can see here the work that we're doing on travel personas. So uh, we have already um, uh, undertaken quite deep segmentation of our traveler population. Uh, so these are people using the network on a regular basis and uh, working uh, with uh, people like Experian, who has their Mosaic database, uh, and also working with about 3,000 people in the West Midlands, we've been able to uh, really develop very detailed segmentation around those people who are traveling the most on the network. Uh, what, we what we intend to do over the winter is then work with um, a small number of people in a very deep and ethnographic way in order to understand their travel behaviors much better so that we can start to um, tailor our uh, communications much better to their needs. Uh, and so on my next slide, you can see how some of that is starting to uh, reflect in our um, COVID-19 applications, helping to make our real time view of the network much more sophisticated. And uh, in the bottom right hand corner, you may just be able to see uh, that the vehicle count from the ANPR cameras is starting to come through. Uh, and I know from uh, listening to people like Matthias, uh, that uh, there are uh, examples of where this technology is being used really successfully in the Netherlands. And uh, we are uh, working increasingly with our international partners to uh, help us to understand technologies better. Uh, since in the UK, this is not uh, commonly used uh, and not commonly applied. And uh, one of the things I'm very interested in as somebody leading on knowledge sharing is to help other public sector clients uh, to buy technology and to buy data very wisely, as uh, we found many clients lack confidence to buy uh, wisely, uh, and also they're very cautious about entering into large scale contracts. And finally, uh, we are limited in budgets as well. And sometimes uh, the budgets that uh, external suppliers think we may have don't match up uh, to what we have available. And so learning how to use this technology ourselves, very hands on way, is really helping us to, um, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to understand and help other clients. Uh, so Suzanne, if you'll permit me just to show a few more slides. Um, really, you know, what we want to do is uh, start to replace our outdated technologies and uh, replace that uh, with 24-7 uh, with data. And I think one of the speakers mentioned the expensive cordon counts uh, that we all use and we certainly do in the United Kingdom. So we want to see if there is a use case for the new technology uh, to reduce some of those costs. And certainly um, that would be uh, around £200,000 in West Midlands alone uh, in the combined authority spent on cordon counting, uh, which we would be happy to avoid. So uh, on my next slide. Uh, you can see how we're building a, a vast data engine in the West Midlands with all our partners. Uh, we have seven local authorities or seven municipalities. There's also Highways England, which maintains the strategic network, road network. And we also have partners with large amounts of data like High Speed 2 and Network Rail. And what we're building is a real time view of the network, but not only the road network, but also public transport and walking and cycling. And on my next slide, uh, yes, please. Thank you so much, Manon, you've been brilliant. Uh, so what we're aiming for is four and a half million data points per day. Uh, and on my next slide, just starting to show. <laughs> thank you so much. Starting to show our work with Amazon Web Services in real time. And we found Amazon Web Services very helpful to us as an organization. Uh, since they embed themselves in our organization and don't just deliver consultancy services. So they've really helped us to work in a sprint uh, approach to uh, get to our uh, real time view uh, using all the different data sources. So rather than um, producing a consultancy report, uh, which, uh, we, which, which may not be as practical in, in our uh, operational application. And what we're really looking to do uh, out of all of this is, uh, is to build uh, operational capability into our reg uh, regional transport coordination centre. Um, it would probably be fair to the other speakers if I finished now, 
Uh, I do have maybe three or four more slides, but um, you can see there how we've uh, approached privacy, ethics and GDPR. And on that last slide, uh, for those of you who want to stay in touch, touch with me, um, I've just included some contact details and some web links uh, to some of our um, uh, most popular pages. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Uh, I've learned a lot from the other speakers and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Manon, for uh, uh, sharing, <laughs> uh, uh, changing the slides. Um, so uh, a great presentation, very comprehensive program of activities. Uh, Deborah, maybe just one question for you, and then we'll have just a few minutes left for, for all the other speakers if they want to come up on, on the virtual stage. And that is um, about data, which has been a common theme throughout all the presentations. Um, naturally and uh, so you talked quite a bit about fixed assets and, and, and infrastructure um, and the work you're doing to get more intelligence from from uh, those uh, those assets and I just wondered what is your view on um, third-party data sources and uh, do you I mean you mentioned a few uh, in in your slides uh, is, is that something that you actually uh, get involved in in West Midlands? That's right. So um, we, are, we are looking at our fixed and our third party data sources. Uh, we do have uh, such a large uh, CCTV control centre and capabilities. And we know that many uh, local authorities or municipalities in the United Kingdom have fixed assets. We really want to understand whether they are the best tools for us to capture this information. Uh, and, and data uh, since a lot of money is, is invested in it uh, and also help those municipalities to understand whether it's cost effective to maintain them and keep them on the network. So I feel this is a pivotal moment in time in traffic management and highways management to really understand whether fixed assets can offer the, us those solutions. And, uh, and if not, then we have to accept that uh, there isn't a need for them. So uh, we're, we're really curious to find out how cost effective they are in comparison to other data sets, uh, since certainly we've found the purchase of mobile phone data very expensive and hasn't provided everything that we need uh, for our traffic management. Uh, and uh, we don't have the um, uh, we don't have the investment to make in uh, large contracts at the moment for that sort of uh, data set. OK. And would anyone else like to comment on that? I mean, have they got any insights to share about uh, procurement of third party data sources? Uh, I know some of the other speakers uh, mentioned this in their presentation. If not, well, yeah, well, you're right that uh, buying buying the mobile uh, phone data is very expensive. Um, uh, therefore, therefore, we in, in in Holland we have the so-called national data warehouse, uh, in which uh, all the all the authorities uh, combined uh, they provide their own data uh, uh, into this data warehouse, and um, so. Um, with the uh, kind of a combination of data and data fusion, you can get uh, you can get along uh, for well for uh, quite a, quite a good quality, but um, actually the mobile phone data is is uh, you can't yeah you can't beat it actually. So sometimes we uh, for for projects uh, we 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 just buy it yeah, but not not on a regular uh, basis. Okay, Matthias. I think the most important thing is that you buy it uh, as a city just once and not three or four times because there are four administrations and mm -hmm. uh, the traffic management yeah, center yeah. then we buy it and then the local yeah. authority as well. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a problem eh? because you buy Shark. the tools uh, with it. And then the second problem is um, where you were talking about is about the accuracy. But for, for me, for me uh, to speak, the accuracy is accuracy. Uh, I think you say in English is uh, not so important. We, I don't want to know how how many exact cars are there, but I want to know. Um, I want to have a, an insight in the is it high or low. If you go to Google Maps uh, traffic data, you see red, orange, and green, and you don't want to know ex the exact amount of, of data. So the accuracy is less important, and therefore, for example, Telram is not very accurate actually. Uh, uh, but it, it gives a great insight. No, no but a accuracy is not maybe the real importance, but um, reliability is very important. If they say it's 100 cars, then it must be 100. 
I don't care if it's 105 or 100 and uh, or or not, uh, 95, but the 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 amount that is presented, there should be a, re a reliability uh, stamp on it. Like for instance, yeah. this is 90% reliable, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found okay. in the in the last two years, uh, especially with the in 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 our region with B Mobile and uh, uh, well uh, Google. Uh, uh, also, uh, also c came to us with with, with some uh, offers that um, th their their content is uh, th their their data is very reliable at the moment. It is getting uh, more and more reliable. So, yeah, well, but they ask a yeah. uh, high price. Yeah, true. Okay, so this is quite a, a an evolving area, and I, I guess it's very much sort of watch this space, as Deborah said. I mean, you're sort of assessing all the different options, and you're not sure which direction you're going to go to uh, in, in the future. Okay, great. Well, I'm, we're nearly running out of time. We prepared quite a few questions for this uh, panel discussion, but we've run out of time. So maybe I can just ask you all to say how you see the traffic management task uh, evolving in the future. Where do you see us say in, in, in 2030? How, what do you think traffic management will look like and, and really what's needed to, to get there? And if you could be quite um, concise and, and to the point, so maybe start with uh, Suzanne, if that's okay. <laughs> Your, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. So thank you so much for the discussion. It was very interesting, such brilliant um, English to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, it, it, I think this um, discussion was re really good because it showed how differentiated we are um, on the way in traffic management, in the approaches, data management, organizational management. So um, at the moment, I, I have the, the the idea that there are a lot more um, organizations doing um, traffic management and the big question will be how will those work together um, on a regional level, on, on city level, on a national level and with our providers and considering bicyclists who have other um, data on, on of, of communities who do them, them themselves and offer them. So it's a quite a, yeah interesting time and I have yeah the hope that it will be a good con good um, result in the end, but at the moment it is very differentiated. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe Deborah, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I would like it to be um, very much centered on the user of the network, on our customers and uh, to be curated for their intermodal journeys and uh, to be uh, completely um, uh, sort of move away from um, the, uh, the focus on one mode or, uh, and, and uh, sort of large uh, capital investment projects through to uh, much more uh, sort of intimate curation of, of data and information around people's lives. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Jan? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, uh, there was this question about, uh, for, for me, about traffic management uh, being different from uh, mo mobility management. I think in the, in, the, in the future, when we do our mobility management uh, uh, on, a, on a large scale and on a, on the right, in the right way, then traffic management will be a breeze, um, you know, because then the uh, and of course uh, traffic management will be uh, much more personalized. Uh, people use their own devices to make the traffic management, and uh, we we are on the brink of uh, of a very new a new uh, developments with uh, the automated. Or everything is being automated, and uh, so um, I think uh, there will be a lot of um, uh, management. Uh, without being known it is managed if you know what i mean and uh, so it will be a sort of mainstream management instead of a nerdy uh, kind of working field in which we are all uh, residing at the moment uh, we are the nerds of uh, of the municipalities and you know i think you all feel the same and um, <laughs> this will be more a mainstream uh, thing in in a, co a couple of 10 years maybe yeah 
That's I think my opinion. I think you're the only nerdy because you're the only really pure traffic management person. I think the others yeah, have yeah, a slightly okay. broader yeah, but, role. So, yeah, I know, yeah. I know. But but the way you talk about it, uh, <laughs> yeah, it yeah, comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and Matthias, over to you. For yeah, I, I agree with with uh, the other speakers. Effectively, I think the people in 2030 will be more in, involved, uh, mm -hmm. and there will be a lot of more useful and more easy to use tools eh, uh, for data analytics, uh, real time near time uh, historic uh, data and also the data will be more multimodal uh, for example one mode now and then multimodal uh, for in 2030 it will be uh, the case i'm very positive and optimistic about it i'm a little bit concerned about who owns the data who will pay for it and will be will the data be available and open and and are the cities organized to fight against uh, the Amazons and the Googles. I'm a little bit concerned. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a healthy market of data providers here in Europe to be able to supply <laughs> you all with the market. So, so thank you very much. So I guess for me, some of the, the, the key themes that have come out of this session, as I expected, uh, uh, um, we didn't talk so much about technology, which is great. It, we talked about everything else. We talked a bit about tools. We talked a lot about data. Importantly, people, citizens engagement, so communicating with them, but also, you know, getting data from them, getting insights from them, very, very important. Integration, as uh, the nerd said, within the city, getting the different uh, <laughs> departments working together on, on projects, but also at different um, levels. Um, more personalized services, of course. And finally, uh, last but not least, cost savings. I mean, you know, we could do lots if we had limitless money, but we don't. So we really have to think about how we can make the best use of, of you know, the, the public yep. money at the end of the day. So that brings us to the end of our session and we're five minutes over. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to uh, uh, address some of the other issues and I, we didn't necessarily get time to answer all of the questions. I invite all our speakers, please have a quick look at the chat box again to see if there are any questions that you can, can respond to. Uh, the people in the audience, they can also contact our speakers um, directly uh, via the platform. You can send them direct messages, but you also have their email uh, addresses too. So all that remains for me to, to say is thank you very much to our speakers. It was a really, really great session. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, thank you to Manon for, for supporting uh, me and, and some of you. And thank you to the audience. And uh, see you tomorrow for the third round of, uh, of parallel sessions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.